Hello together and welcome back. So today I am again here with Christopher from Norway and we have a great uh, follow-up topic to our last conversation where we talked about uh, about the divide between global or a very globalist view of the world or society and a more local or national view and so there was recently this incident that uh, Twitter banned Trump because they feel like he was misusing their platform or something and then Trump moved to another app that I have never heard of before it's called Parler and many of his uh, of the people that followed him on Twitter also moved to this new app and basically many conservative or more right-wing people just left Twitter completely because there has been a long history of um, Twitter selectively banning or shadow banning or just making life hard for people on the right side of the political spectrum who are more maybe have more conservative values and so we will start our discussion with this problem that a couple of big tech companies that are active globally have somehow uh, seemed to amass a huge amount of power that they basically control the alternative media because it's just on a couple of platforms or also Google that controls the search engine that most people use. So we will start with this. So please, uh, yes, let the audience know what you think of this, Christopher. Right, thank you, Amos. So basically we can say that in in the world, at least in the Western world, we have sort of this big tech oligopoly uh, uh, that you have certain companies who have extremely, uh, they have massive influence and power over the technological industry, especially with regards to social media platforms and, and digital communications in general. And those big tech companies with this huge oligopoly power are mainly uh, Google, Facebook, Amazon, Apple, uh, those companies uh, together, they form, you could almost say it, it, it works sort of like a cartel. I'm not sure how much these companies cooperate. That's a very interesting question to dive into, how much they actually uh, conspire, perhaps that, that might be something, but at least they have a huge monopoly power and they can suppress competitors and competing alternative so social media platforms, for instance, if they don't uh, desire them or like them at all. And I think we, we saw this happen very recently with this new social media platform, Parler. Now I haven't heard ab about this platform either until very recently, because after, as you said, uh, Trump was banned from Twitter, and also in the general context of Twitter banning and censoring several uh, right-wing or dissident right-wing people, uh, from the platform. There seems to be a huge number of people seeking alternatives. So I think it was the case that Trump, even Trump himself, moved to Parler. I think he did so. And then many other right-wing Trump supporters and, and also other right-wing people moved to that platform because they had enough. They had enough of, of all this Twitter censoring and suppressing of their free speech in, in that platform. So Parler became uh, very popular in a short amount of time, it seemed. Uh, but then you saw Amazon and Apple and Google, at the very least, uh, those three decided to suppress Parler and block access to that uh, social media platform. So uh, I think Amazon uh, removed it from their services. I think Google managed to do so, so that people couldn't find the app on Google Play, on Android phones. I think Apple did the same on their iPhones. Um, and um, and, uh, and, and in general, blocked access so people couldn't really find that app and use it. And that became a huge problem. So I think the, uh, the manager of that parlor app, he said that uh, we are really in trouble now. I, I need, really need to find out how we can find an alternative uh, uh, means to, to make people gain access to this. Because if not, then the whole parlor app will uh, be destroyed. All the data which, are, which is saved inside of that will be destroyed and deleted if, it's, if it is inactive 
for a certain amount of time, so they are really in a crisis now. And, and I think this shows very clearly that big tech companies, they deliberately decided to suppress access to completely crush Parler because Parler um, embraced and, and tolerated uh, certain right-wing groups, uh, Trump supporters, so that they could have a voice in there. And, and big tech didn't like it. They think that those political ideas were dangerous uh, for the United States. Uh, especially with regards to what happened recently in Capitol Hill. So they had this, you could almost say it's a sign of uh, kind of uh, paranoia. Uh, and they decided to do that. And, and that's a, I would say, a huge problem because it shows how dangerous this big tech monopoly or oligopoly can be when just at, at their will, they can suppress alternative platforms if they don't like it and really do that successfully. I think that's a huge danger, especially when they do so of ideological reasons. So that doesn't sound good for the uh, for this free speech of people. Uh, so, so that's something that people should uh, should be aware of and, and realize the danger with this big tech monopoly. Yes, I think you you portrayed the danger very well, and I just wanted to add another example. So, or two. One is a Patreon that also defunded many right-wing uh, independent producers that had to move away from Patreon. I think, for example, uh, what's his name? Dave Rubin moved away. Joe Rogan went away from Patreon. Jordan Peterson also, that was like a year ago, went away from Patreon. Uh, Lauren Southern was banned even before that. So yes, and also, of course, the fact that all these platforms, uh, including YouTube, make it, they, they, they start to censor and, and censor the content that is uh, not commensurate with their preferred ideology. Then also this platform called Telegram has absolutely just exploded in terms of, of user numbers. So I think I read somewhere that they have something like 25 million new users within the last month. So, and of course, Telegram also says that um, they don't they don't check the content at all. The content is end to end encrypted, so they can't even check the content. At least, if it's true what they are promising. But I think it's open source, so it's quite probable that it is. Now, of course, you already or I read somewhere in some uh, newspaper article about some politicians, I think it was in Germany, but I'm not sure anymore, that said all these uh, conspiracy theorists, um, first of all, the conspiracy theorists are dangerous because all of the people that, for example, stormed this uh, Capitol Hill or anyone who refuses to follow the, the regulations that are put in place because of Corona. They are all uh, conspiracy theorists and they are all get their information from Telegram. So I felt like there is already a preparation to maybe ban Telegram because it can, it is, you are creating this argument that it is dangerous when people can get their inf information from wherever they want. Um, because uh, yes, then they follow conspiracy theories and then they start uh, invading the capital or boycotting the very important uh, regulations of the government. So there is like, this is very interesting because we will talk about this later. This is the other side, how also the government maybe helps the, let's say the good guys in the big tech to ban the bad guys like Google is a good guy and Facebook is a good guy and Telegram is a bad guy because they don't censor the content. So this is very problematic in terms of free speech. Yes. Yes, exactly. And then it really, uh, it was really also surprising to me that the uh, people uh, you mentioned, uh, Joe Rogan, Dave Rubin, and, and I view those people as very moderate people. I don't find them really right-wing at all. I think they're pretty much open to many ideas. So I, I, that, that even those people who, whom are very moderate and very open uh, 
and many of them have many liberal values even, that they would be viewed as this sort of right-wing threat or uh, should be warned before watching them. Uh, that, that sounds very frightening to me, to be uh, honest, that even those people who are very moderate are looked with, uh, suspiciously. Um, so that's something really to, to think about. And, and also, you mentioned uh, Telegram uh, with uh, the new 25 million new members or something like that. I, I think also that that is very uh, so, something to think uh, to think about because 25 million people that's five times uh, Norway or more than uh, your Swiss population if I remember correctly. So so it it really shows that it's it's going farther and farther and farther to the extreme. So that no, not only extreme right wing, for instance, neo Nazis are banned because that's one thing, but even very moderate people are uh, are beginning to to be sort of persecuted on on big tech. So that that's uh, that shows the extent and the, the gravity of the entire issue. So that even ordinary people might feel that their free speech is is taken away. Yes, um, I just wanted to. To be precise, I don't think that Dave Rubin and Joe Rogan were thrown from from uh, Patreon. I think they they quit their Patreon uh, affiliation voluntarily as a protest against this um, the fact that more conservative or maybe people who have a bit more uh, pronounced view. A more right-wing pronounced view than they do were banned from the platform because they say free speech is an important value so we will uh, not support this platform anymore i think this is how i have it in my head i'm not entirely up to date on this issue and also i think the 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 thing it's it's gradual it's not like the the right-wing uh people who subscribe to maybe right-wing ideas or just more conservative. I, I don't like to say right-wing because it sounds like they are very extreme, but it's just normal people who are very, these are, these are not extreme views by any stretch of the imagination. These are just, maybe we could just call it conservative views that these people, they are not, I think straight out persecuted on these platforms, but they are kind of uh, nagged. Like it's just, for example, if you produce content, if you produce a video uh, that supports a more conservative viewpoint, then more often than not this video, you cannot monetize it on YouTube or it will not be recommended as much to other people to view it as, for example, a video with a very uh, left-wing uh, viewpoint or a very uh, liberal is also the wrong word, but like the, the more progressive is also the wrong word, but that's what they call themselves. So it's just like the, the, the rules are not even. Some people, they get more supported and others, they get more uh, hindered. And I think many people that like to get a balanced view, they are just sick of it. They, they want to get the information unfiltered so that they can decide for themselves what, is, what they think is right and what they think is wrong. And they don't want some algorithm or some big company or some ideology that tells them what they should think. And I think that's why a lot of people are, yes, starting to look for alternative platforms where this is not happening. And so we, we talked now about the power that these large companies have. And I would be very interested because it's, it's you, you mentioned it correctly as an oligopoly. It's not exactly a monopoly, but it's not that far away from it either because there are just a few that have this huge market power. Um, maybe we could talk a bit about how this came about. Yes, very, very good point. So uh, and also an important precision you made there as well, uh, that 
yes, those modern people, they aren't actually persecuted and censored right now. That's not the case. That's true. But we see that they are not uh, given equal grounds, you could say, that it's the rules are not even. So, so it's still a danger, a danger there, um, even if they aren't actually being persecuted yet. So that's an important position. Very good. Um, yes, how this monopoly power came about, that's, a, that's an interesting topic because um, some, especially libertarians, they seem to be divided on the issue about how to understand these big tech companies. Many of them would perhaps just argue that they are private companies, they have the right to do whatever they want, and that they are uh, huge monopoly powers, that, 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 that is okay because they are pro providing very valuable resources and services to the customers, and they are more efficient, they produce better quality that, than their competitors. So therefore it's completely natural and good that they should have this economic power because they are really providing the customers what they want. They are doing something for them more and better than their competitors. So therefore some libertarians would perhaps argue that it, it's good and it's not a problem that they are so big, or at least they would say that it, it, there are many good aspects of having this big tech uh, monopoly. But I would be suspicious of that analysis because I think this big tech monopoly, I, I'm not sure if it could be said that they have this monopoly pattern that's good because they are providing so many good services. Rather, first of all, I would, I would for, uh, first of all doubt that they came about through a free market mechanism in the first place because the whole, you could say, internet system, it, it's very, very complicated. And it's mingled into several systems of laws and regulations and customs um, in which the government is heavily involved and has been since its creation. Uh, the internet was first created by the United States military for military purposes. So already in the beginning, we see that there has been a very sort of close connection between uh, the government and the internet and as the internet gradually grew and you got this uh, these uh, new services uh, search engines etc uh, the government has been to some degree or another involved in that uh, when it comes to for instance copyright uh, claims or or patent laws now there is a disagreement about whether patent laws are legitimate or not but at least you see that it is a complicated system in which the government has been heavily involved and you also see i believe big tech having lobbied the government to give them certain privileges and that have helped them at the expense of their uh, customers. So therefore I would be suspicious toward the, the, the idea that the, the social media platform is, is a free market. Rather, it seems to me that there is a very complicated cronyist system where there are some connections there which wouldn't exist in a genuine, completely free market. So that's something uh, um, I think people should. Uh, I think people should think of it in that way instead of see it as a, as a free, as a free market. Because I would I would doubt that it that it actually is, and and as we see now, we see that uh, YouTube, uh, Facebook, Apple, Amazon, they are really embracing and promoting several values. Uh, you could say that are um, sanctioned by the government or promoted by the government. So you see this close connection and as you mentioned um, uh, earlier in, in this discussion that it seems that this, these big tech companies are promoting some globalist or globalistic values and ideas uh, so that they are, they are sort of, um, you could almost say they are in some sense or another being agents for some values or ideas that the current governmental structure want to implement and want people to believe. So it seems that uh, they have this ideological bond with the government and not only this physical bond, but this ideological bond. And, uh, and that, 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 that is scary because uh, the government uh, of course may implement and enforce its values and principles to people in, in several ways. One is directly through state force, but you could also argue that it could do it indirectly with influencing big tech companies and perhaps pressing them into, uh, into promoting their ideas and values for them so that they are sort of an extension of the, of the principles and the goals of the state. That sounds perhaps a bit extreme, but to some degree, I think, I think that could, could be said. And also it should be mentioned that I think big tech companies to some degree have pressure 
from lobbyists and governmental groups for doing the right thing. So for instance, let's say that Twitter didn't ban anyone or YouTube didn't censor anyone at all uh, on their platforms. I think the government would, uh, I think they would fear the government would actually intervene and do something about it, or perhaps they would uh, implement mandates to force them to do so. So I think they have in mind that if we don't do what, uh, what we are pressed to do at the current moment, uh, the government would interfere in some way or another in the future. So I think there is this indirect warning or indirect pressure involved. Um, and also, I, I would think that the leadership in those companies, they are themselves committed to many of those ideas and values that, uh, uh, that they use when they censor dissidents. Um, so that, that's what I would say about it. Uh, what do you think? Yes, yes, great. I think you have, you have mentioned many very important points. I will just start by, by repeating them for myself and for the audience, and then we will see where it goes. So I think the first important point that you mentioned is that we shouldn't start with the assumption that these huge companies developed in a free market. And you mentioned uh, that there have always been laws and regulations that have interfered or that have been intermingled with the internet and also with its development. Uh, you mentioned, for example, copyright and patent laws. Um, you could also mention some like privacy or data security policies that, for example, the EU does not allow certain data to travel to US servers, uh, etc. And of course, there are there is the physical infrastructure, these, these, uh, these uh, wires that transmit the data, they go through the ocean and they enter the coast at some point. And then there is a, a service station or a, a routing station and this routing station is there physically. And of course the government has access to this. And so this is, I think one important point and then you also mentioned this very important uh, or maybe following from this point the, the the interaction between these big companies or the ones that got really big and the government and i think this is an important point to to dwell on for a moment that um the government can put pressure onto the big companies and the big companies can put pressure onto the government and the government can benefit from cooperating with these big companies and the big companies can also benefit from cooperating with the government so let's let's just see what what is important here in this aspect so yes for example um um, it's it's hard to to start because there is like too much too much to mention. But for example, uh, the government can access, or in the U.S., there is a law that the government can access any data center and use the data that is stored there if they think it is uh, relevant for the national security. So basically, all these platforms are like huge uh, information gathering tools for the intelligence service of the US. Now that is one reason why some, some uh, politicians in Europe then say, well, these platforms are a danger. But, um, and at the same time, there are, as we said, platforms like Facebook and Google that they, they um, are open to cooperate with the government. So for example, they, they, they engage in censoring certain people or, or certain uh, certain content, and these are then, as we already mentioned, the good guys, and they get uh, like yes, they can they can improve their business, and then there are platforms like Telegram, for example, where the content is not filtered; it is uh, even encrypted. Maybe the 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 operator shouldn't even be able to know what is the content of these conversations and these are then portrayed by the government as a danger 
and of course for Facebook and WhatsApp and all the like Twitter it is very good if the government portrays their competitors as a danger and maybe even bans them because then they keep the big share of the of the market so yes I think we should stay a bit in this uh, how these uh, big companies and governments interact and grew together like like a web yes yes uh, very interesting points uh, you raised there about about the system and, and how and how government regulations affect affect the whole scenario and now i wouldn't say that the government is the ultimate source of this sort of liberal ideology imposing itself rather i would say this is a sort of a societal problem in general and it, this goes back to the first conversation we had about it seems that there are ideas or ideologies in society which sort of imposes itself on society and suppresses alternative ideologies and it seems rather to be in the very nature and structure of society itself to have some unifying dominant set of values that imposes itself so you can't really have total and pure pluralism that doesn't really work you have to have some unifying system uh, of values and ideas and those ideas and values might be good or they might be bad and in this case it seems to be this liberal uh, or left-wing ideology which gets increasingly more and more radical for uh, for each year and it seems that this general atmosphere of this liberal ideo ideology um, imposing itself on the society um, manifest through governmental uh, systems, uh, laws, legislations, politicians, uh, and, and then using their state power to, to further and str more strongly impose those values upon uh, big tech and, and other companies. But also, as you said, it might go the other way as well. So we see big tech also embracing many of these general left-wing or liberal ideological values and then they are influencing society through their platforms and also lobbying and and having connections with the government influencing the government and uh, and uh, funding certain agencies or organizations which further implement and and spread liberal or left-wing values which also getting more and more radical for for each year and therefore you see this close bond, uh, this system which is intermingled, which is uh, in, in several ways and on several levels imposing those liberal or left-wing ideas. Uh, so they are sort of used as agents for this ideology. I, I would perhaps see it that way, at least to a certain degree. And also I, I think uh, about this, how this intermingling works out. I think it also in, it's important to point out uh, that the US government has a clear history of uh, uh, spying on people, on interfering with people's privacy, on using the internet to control people. For instance, after 9-11, we saw that the government passed uh, the Patriot Act, which uh, gave it access to people's uh, private uh, information, I think it was. I, I'm, I'm not an expert on how actually the legislation worked, but at least it, it, it increased the power of the state to interfere in people's lives through, for instance, the internet uh, in the name of combating terrorism. And, and this hasn't stopped, uh, um, I would say, this hasn't ceased to be the case. And we saw, for instance, with Edward Snowden revealing things about the NSA, another government agency, and their activities uh, and involvement in, in society and in the internet and in people's privacy lives. Uh, so given this general atmosphere or, or context of the government having a clear history of involving itself in people's lives, controlling people through the internet and, and attacking people's privacy in several ways, I think this general uh, system has, uh, has certainly uh, been implemented. Uh, and and I, I would say that this has something to do with this intermingling we see with, between big tech and the government. So I, I wouldn't be too naive and say that, oh no, those those attacks on the privacy with the Patriot Act, they have ceased. I think they, they are still in place in some way or another and that they are relevant to, to the system. Uh, so what do you think of that? Yes, yes. I think uh, you helped me 
find the track again. So I, because I think this is very true what you said that it is not um, the government that is driving this um, spread of this ideology, but somehow, as we have discussed, ideologies kind of have a life of their own. So they come up and then they grow and then they are at like their peak and then they become old and they die again and a new ideology comes up to replace them. And so I think you are absolutely right. This is what we see here that the <clears throat> this very progressive or liberal as it's called ideology of um, yes, the entire world should be like one society and all people are equal and you cannot distinguish between people. And I don't mean of equal moral worth, but I mean of equal capabilities. So this idea that, for example, uh, the fact that a woman is less strong physically than a man is just a societal construct. It is, has nothing to do with, with material reality or the fact that maybe not all uh, people of all ethnic uh, of all ethnicities have the same IQ on average. All of these things would be very offensive to this new ideology because it says everybody is the same and everybody should be the same. And also there is a very heavy focus on equality of outcome. That if not everybody has the same status or, or outcome in society, then it is because society is racist or homophobic or bigoted or the, the white man that suppresses the other people. That's the only reason why our societies, for example, have more uh, material resources and wealth in the view of this ideology. And I think, as you said, this ideology has kind of a life of its own and it spreads. And that's why, I don't know why this is, but the, the government that enforces this ideology is an effect of the fact that the ideology is spreading in society. It is a societal problem. And also then the fact that big companies are uh, trying to spread this ideology goes in the same direction because they try to appeal to the broad public. And if the broad public shares this ideology, then they will like it if the company endorses these values. So, and what I think is an important point that I would want to make is that there has always been this problem that the very rich people and the very powerful people, they work hand in hand. So the government and the big owners of resources or of companies or of land or whatever is the important thing at that time, they work together and to some extent, sad to say, against the common man or the common citizen. So if you look in the Industrial Revolution, when the, when the people went on strike because they were starving from the, the wages that they were paid in the, in the coal mines or in the factories, then the big uh, factory owners went to the government and the government sent the military to break up the strike. So this is, of course, has nothing to do with a free market or a right to protest or a right to, to yes, to, to stand up for a decent wage, but no, they were crushed. And so I think the same thing we see over and over again, that the, the people that have power, the government, and the people that are very rich or very uh, economically powerful, there is a tendency that they work together to profit on the expense or at the expense of the common population. And I think this is just a general problem that people love power. Power is very intoxicating. And maybe it's nothing new that we see here. It's just the current uh, instantiation of this problem. Yes, that's a very uh, good analysis. And this is sort of, a, as you say, this is a very general consideration about society and history in, in general, as we see a very 
specific or particular manifestation of uh, right now you could you could sort of say and and i would also say that the, this uh, modern uh, ideology the ideology of modernity or liberalism is um, you could see that the big tech companies or the modern uh, uh, state capitalist or lobbyist capitalist or crony capitalist is perhaps the best word uh, market and system today it practices many of the uh, aspects of liberalism which uh, i would argue are destructive and and uh, and uh, the, uh, the scholar Patrick Deneen has written a very great book on this uh, called Why Liberalism Failed. It's a very good book talking about liberalism, how it works, its philosophy, etc. And it and it and it talks about how it seems that modern uh, modernity or the modern capitalist or or big tech company system is uh, is very into the liberal values that people's self-expression or or material pleasure should be uh, maximized or enhanced so for instance when we see google facebook amazon apple their services and uh, and um, products that they give out to the consumers and customers are very much oriented toward maximizing their private sphere for instance how the social media has become so addictive to so many people that they have become very uh, isolated and becoming sort of their own individual sphere and uh, undermining social bonds with other human beings because now you have this social media which sort of gets all of your attention uh, gets, gets all of your attraction and attention so i think we see that in the very practice the economic practice of these companies we see that uh, the liberal ideas of extreme individualism and material pleasure and isolating yourself maximizing your private sphere and undermining social bonds and communal bonds with other people i think this liberal tendency is already present in the economic uh, system so it uh, therefore we can see some interesting philosophical connection between how they practice and their um their um, system of censoring and imposing liberal values that enhances for instance various on very self-expressive self-expressive ideas for instance to take it to a very extreme uh, and uh, this uh, transgender idea that the gender expression is all about how you feel instead of your human nature or essence now the whole transgender thing is another discussion but that's just an extreme example that i'm uh, using right now so i think we see this liberal tendency it, it's it's to some degree rooted in modernity itself and how the modern economic system is practiced to maximize consumers selfish pleasures and needs and their private sphere at the expense of social bonds and communal bonds and culture we see that modern systems of of uh, economics is sort of undermining cultural norms and traditions uh, which also is an aspect of modern liberalism so so that's a very interest, interesting philosophical connection uh, I would I would see right uh, right there and also as you mentioned uh, this very interesting tendency that uh, that the wealthy and the powerful sort of have this common interest in uh, imposing these dominant values and, and ideas and, and that reminds me of an interesting paradox that the modern uh, crony capitalists or lobbyists, they are also imposing this uh, left-wing idea that capitalism is evil, we have to reform it, we have to help the poor, we uh, have to combat inequality. Social inequality is a very, very central um, value to the left right now. And it seems that the big companies, uh, those whom we might call presenting this idea of woke capital, that big companies are promoting this bulk or radical left-wing ideology, which includes destroying inequality, destroying capitalism. And that's very ironic when that very idea comes from many of the very, very rich and wealthy companies. Uh, so it's a very interesting paradox and an irony uh, right there. So it seems rather that the left-wing idea of that we need, we need to destroy capitalism, we need to destroy inequality, you could sort of say that in reality it's about replacing the current system with an even more intensely unequal society where power is even more concentrated in the hands of the few but in a very ironic and invisible way perhaps what what do you think of this yes i think you brought up two very very interesting points here and 
the, the first one I really haven't thought of at all until now, and this is great. It's this idea that um, these global tech companies, they, they basically, they represent this ideology. They, the product that they sell is an effect of this ideology that you should maximize your self-expression and your personal space and that culture or the society at large is of, of very little importance. And I think we even talked about this once that the welfare state is also an effect of this. So instead of relying on your community of which you are a part to be like to help you up again when you fall, you have this huge anonymous uh, welfare system which doesn't interfere with my personal expression because I can have purple hair and do whatever I want and the, the social the welfare state doesn't care whereas uh, if I were in a smaller more local circle then maybe people would say hey what what's wrong with you maybe maybe you should conform to the norms of the group a little bit and of course, um, so this is the first point that I, I really enjoyed that these companies, they basically, they sell products that live from this ideology. And so it seems somehow even only natural that they try to defend and promote this ideology because this is basically the essence and the core of their existence. They, they came out of this ideology and they live from it and they want to serve it and enhance it. So there is, this seems very logical. And I would also want to make a point that um, we should be careful not to demonize this whole modern, the whole development that this modern ideology has produced and fall into this trap that in the past, everything was better and everybody was just wonderful and lovely uh, in, in, uh, enclosed in their culture and everybody was happy and everything was great. There were also problems with the old uh, way and there are also advantages to the new way that is now very, uh, very much uh, in trend and, and still growing, but I think as everything, it is a question of the right balance. And what we what we see right now is this ideology, it has basically, it has picked up a lot of speed and momentum. And now it just, it just keeps going forward and it can go to the point where it will be too extreme and the, the social interaction or the community or the thinking about society as a whole instead of only your your own private self-expression where the balance will tip to the other side and then it will also be a big problem and yes and to your last point that this uh, it is very ironic that the most rich and powerful people keep uh, spreading this message that capitalism is evil and that we should destroy the inequality I think this is very characteristic of what we have said because these people, they don't want a free market. They want to freeze the state of society as it is right now, because right now they are on the top. And so they want to now, now let's freeze it and keep it this way. Because of course, in a free market, you can be the most important company today and completely irrelevant tomorrow. But if you freeze everything, then this cannot happen anymore. And so the kind of equality that they want is kind of the equality for, for the peasant or for the, for the lower levels of society. They should all be equal. But then there is the elite that lives somehow completely separate and have a completely different, uh, different uh, standard of measurement. Of course, it's not that Jeff Bezos wants to be equal in outcome with you and me. But he wants you and me to be equal with each other so that we are happy and quiet. 
while, and I'm not against Jeff Bezos in particular, it's just a name that came to my mind. Um, but the people that are at the top, they want to have like their elite circle in which they interact. And then the, the equality is just for, for the common people, for the commoners, yes. Yes, that, that reminds me of this old saying that um, all people shall be equal, but some will be more equal than others. <laughs> so that, uh, that points out what, uh, what you mentioned right there. And, and that's a very interesting uh, phenomenon to see this weird tendency of huge, powerful and wealthy groups of people promoting ideas that allegedly condemn modern inequality and, uh, and capitalism, etc. It, it rather seems that they are actually condemning aspects of that economic system as it exists right now, which isn't controlled by the wealthy and powerful. And they call it capitalism and then they justify reforms which actually intensify the concentration of power. Uh, and, and many people would argue that the, the current um, idea of, uh, of the Great Reset that after the corona restrictive system is gone and we are sort of liberated from all this, then we will finally implement massive amounts of economic reform, structural reforms to deal with inequality and social problems. Uh, and therefore we would make things better. And th that seems to be an idea uh, proposed by huge companies and, and politicians. And, and I would say sort of globalist elites. Uh, and, and, and I would, and, and it seems to me that they would actually just intensify their power by doing that, by uh, having this great reset idea, even though it seems that, oh, they are dealing with inequality and social problems, rather it's actually intensifying the inequality. And, and that's how I would say, therefore, uh, that throughout history, we have seen very interesting connections, for instance, that uh, uh, David Rockefeller, one of the most powerful and wealthiest uh, bankers and capitalists of the 20th century, he, I think, praised China, Red China, under Mao Zedong. And that's very interesting. How can a wealthy capitalist praise an extremely intense uh, and totalitarian communist system under Mao Zedong? So that, that, that seems very weird, but that, that, that I think would show that the connection between the capitalist or Western chronic capitalist systems and uh, communist systems in the 20th century, they weren't so far away from each other. So I think there are some interesting connections with point back to that exact point that we are uh, talking about right now. So that's an interesting phenomenon that needs to be analyzed more in general in society, I think. And also, yes, uh, uh, to emphasize the point about how modern uh, cronist systems is rather in, in the very core of their systems or their practices uh, have this very individualistic idea that your self-expression, your feelings, your material pleasure, it was matters. That's what we want to enhance and emphasize at the expense of uh, communal bonds of natural law so that your feelings and your pleasure is disconnected from reality. For instance, with the transgenderism uh, and many other extreme things which are getting normalized more and more and, and imposed on uh, us others more and more so. So this very interesting connection with this extreme individualism and maximizing the private sphere, I think that's very, uh, um, I think that that reveals some of the uh, ideological or philosophical roots of the very left-wing values that we, we see today. So uh, yeah, that's basically the two points I think we could say to sort of sum up the important considerations. Yes, great. Um, and I think uh, maybe we we could talk about this some other time. This uh, the the philosophy that is at the bottom of all this, the philosophy that your private pleasure and your private self-expression is the most important thing. I and you mentioned uh, transgender the transgender phenomenon, I think it would be interesting to talk about this uh, in more detail because this is a, maybe at the heart of all of this. And also, I think we have now, we have made a very nice uh, turn and I would like to, to sum it up. And then maybe if you have something to add, then you could do that. And then we could close 
this uh, discussion for today. So we started basically with uh, the fact that Twitter banned Trump and Trump moved to another platform and that then other tech companies, big tech companies tried to basically push this platform out of the market and were quite successful at it. So we've seen that these big tech companies have gained a huge amount of power. And we then asked the question, how did they get all this power, which is, it's not just a monopoly, but it's like an oligopoly. So a few have most of the market power. And you then rightly pointed out that this is not an effect of the free market, but it is maybe to a large extent, at least the effect of a crony capitalism where these companies lobby the government and the government presses the companies and they kind of intermingle with each other. And we also said that this intermingling of the rich and the powerful is basically something that has been a problem all throughout history because the rich have an interest to stay rich and the powerful have an interest to stay in power. And so they have this interest to freeze society as it is in the moment. And that could basically be the reason why this weird, almost paradoxical thing happens that the people who have gained the most through the free market then turn around and start uh, criticizing the free market and start saying how important state and government control is and they start looking to even communist systems as very desirable. And also an important point that you mentioned is that this ideology of uh, maximizing one's personal pleasure and one's personal uh, just one's personal space is not that the government imposes this ideology, but the ideology kind of has a life of itself. And this development that we have described is probably more an effect of this ideology than the other way around. Yes, that's a good summary. And also I could uh, comment on the general consideration about uh, liberalism or the modern ideology of modernity itself. Um, so, so I would say that that ideology or those values uh, of liberalism is fundamentally bad and need to be replaced. Liberalism needs to go. But uh, as you said, that doesn't mean that we have to go completely back to the past because there are technological changes that uh, uh, we should keep. And I don't think we even could go back to the past, technologically speaking, completely, perhaps to some degree, but uh, to go completely, I don't even think if that's possible. So I would say the, the values and the ideology of modern liberalism and modernity needs to go, but that doesn't mean that we have to get rid of all the technology, of course. Uh, so yeah, that's how would I, I would comment on that. Yes, I, I think I would not say that the values are bad, like, a hundred percent, but I think it's kind of going too far at the moment. I think it's out of balance with other values that are also important, but maybe this is a topic that we could discuss some other time. And it would be interesting if we not, if we don't agree on the, on the view of a certain topic, it would still be interesting to discuss it. I think. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, so in that case, I thank you very much for this conversation. Again, I think it was absolutely fascinating and also very important and very uh, up to date. This is a really currently very important topic that we have talked about. And I will give you the last word before we say goodbye. Yes, well, thank you very much on uh, having me on. and. Uh... We'll surely, as you say, return to many, some of these subjects maybe on a later occasion because, yes, it is an important issue. So, yes, thank you again for having me on. Great. Thank you too. Bye-bye. Goodbye.